I want to start our next uh, session. My name is, is Amir Ashur and I am a senior research fellow at the center here in, in Beersheba and my field of study is the Karaginiza. So our first uh, speaker is, is Tamar Hertig who is an associate professor of early modern history at Tel Aviv University, where she serves as director of the Curiel Institute for European Studies. Her books in include Savanna World Women, Visions and Reform in the Renaissance Italy, Christ Transformed into a Virgin Woman, Lucia Brocadelli, Henrich in Instituris, and the defense of the faith, and the book in Hebrew on the Italian Renaissance. She is completing a book tentatively titled The Virtuoso Goldsmith, Sex, Crime, and Jewish Conversion in Renaissance Italy, another current book project funded by the Israel Science Foundation explores the experience of nuns who were baptized Jews. Tamara, please. First of all, thank you. I wanted to thank the organizers, Nimrod and uh, Effie, for inviting me to speak in this session. And I have to say, I just uh, lived through the abstract uh, booklet, and I realized <laughs> that I'm actually um, not going to talk about what the abstract says that I will talk about, uh, because working on this paper, preparing it for today, made me rethink my project. So, uh, on um, nuns and Jewish conversion to Christianity in early modern Italy, so I'm very grateful for this opportunity. And I look forward to hearing uh, your feedback on this project. Unlike other late medieval and early modern agents of conversion, nuns involved in the endeavors to secure Jewish conversion to Christianity seldom left behind accounts of their activities, nor were they immortalized as individual converters. Their conversionary efforts were communal rather than individual, and since they were directed exclusively at girls and women, they are often obscured in the historical record, with privileging the conversion uh, conversion narratives focusing on Jewish men. This paper begins with a rare testimony of nuns' conversionary activities, which elucidates nuns' roles in facilitating Jewish conversion before the outbreak of the Protestant Reformation. I then move on to the institutionalization of conversionary efforts as part of the reinvigoration of the Catholic Church from the 1540s onwards, and discuss the adoption of the, of the convent as the model for the female branch of the first house of catechumens. This choice, I argue, discloses the widespread appreciation of female religious communities as the ideal setting for inducing the successful transformation of female Jews into pious Christians. However, it also reflects the growing discomfort with the allocation of prospective converts to convents at a time in which nunnery's complete separation from society figured high on the agenda of Catholic reformers. The paper's final part explores a case from 1583 that exposes the tension between these two religious goals, converting the Jews and reforming women's monastic communities, which came into play when a Jewess who was reluctant to convert was assigned to a convent. As an analysis of this case reveals, although houses of catechumens were intended to divest nuns of their roles as agents of conversion, the unequal pace of their spread throughout the Italian peninsula ensured that nuns continued to function as converters well into the late 17th century. The first non-converters con that I want to discuss are the observant Augustinian sisters of San Matteo in the Umbrian town of Spoleto, who in June 1496 welcomed the five-year-old Jewish girl Chiara Stella, who had run away from home into their convent. Keen to see her embrace Christianity, the abbess, Sister Agatha, and her fellow nuns had Chiara Stella instructed in the tenets of the faith and oversaw preparations for her baptism. Once her parents, Gentile and Abramo, found out that she was staying with the nuns, they requested that she be returned to them, but the nuns refused to let her go. The Jewish couple then, then turned to the Bishop of Spoleto for help in retrieving their daughter. 
Gentile and Abramo were well aware of the canon law prohibition on the abduction of Jewish children who were legally considered minors and therefore subject to parental authority in order to have them baptized. They argued that at age five, even if the girl expressed her wish to convert, this was the result of the nun's flattery or, or of her fear of them and could not be considered an indication of her consent to baptism. Since she was not offered for baptism by either one of her parents, she had to be returned to them as a Jew. The Bishop of Spoleto, Constantino Eroli, delegated the task of resolving the affair to his vicar, who bade the nuns to discontinue the preparations for the girl's baptism under pain of excommunication. The nuns were ordered to hand Chiara Stella over to a Christian laywoman named Casaletta, who was entrusted with caring for her, while the Episcopal vicar investigated the matter in order to determine the girl's true intentions. On July 4th, Abbas Agatha and her fellow nuns appealed to the Apostolic Legate and Governor of Spoleto, Cardinal Giovanni Borgia, nephew of the uh, reigning Pope Alexander VI, who um, protesting the Episcopal vicar's ruling. According to the nuns, when Chiara Stella had first arrived in their convent, the bishop had willingly consented to her stay there and his later decision to his, entrust his vicar with her removal from their nunnery was the result of his frail health. The vicar, they complained, had refused to decide the girl's fate in a proper judicial proceeding in which both sides would be given a fair hearing. After all their efforts to ensure the Jewish girl's conversion, he decreed that she could no, lo could no longer be subject to their abbess authority and be placed directly under the bishop's authority instead. By publicizing the threat of excommunicating them, he showed a lack of respect for their community, and he especially humiliated them by publicly siding with Chiara Stella's Jewish parents, thereby, thereby implying that the nuns were at fault. To undo the offense to their communal honor, the nuns asked that the girl's future be decided by their Augustinian provincial, Paolo Spoleto, or in his absence by the prior of the Augustinian hermits of San Nicolo in Spoleto. When Cardinal Borgia's lieutenant and deputy Giovanni Oliver received the nun's supplication, he ordered both the bishop and the girl's parents to appear in his castle within three days. Until he reached a decision in the matter, he forbade the bishop or his vicar to take any steps that could endanger the nun's reputation and warned them not to renew the threat to have them excommunicated. Tellingly, in Oliver's decree, the victims were neither the Jewish girl nor her parents, but rather the nuns. From a dispute involving a potential child convert, the case now focused on the nuns' reputation as pious converters. On July 9, however, Alexander VI himself intervened in the affair and issued a brief addressed to the Augustinian provincial, who was entrusted with seeing to the conclusion of the controversy in accordance with the papal verdict. Before having this brief drafted, the Pope received yet another supplication from the nuns. Whereas in their earlier appeal, appeal to his nephew, Giovanni Borgia, the nuns had stressed the offense to their convent's honor, in their supplication to the Pope, they focused on the danger that the intervention of the bishop's vicar posed to the state of Chiara Stella's soul. They argued that the girl had expressed her desire to convert, and when her parents came to take her from San Mateo, she refused to go with them, and repeatedly affirmed that she wished to become a Christian. When she was sent to Casaleta's home, where her mother was allowed to talk to her, I quote, she always persisted in saying what she had said earlier, namely that she wished and intended to be a Christian, end of quote. And her parents could not wrench out from her the prayers that she had learned during her stay in the nunnery. In their supplication to the Pope, the nuns noted that their convent was an observant one and stressed the good fama reputation in which they were known to be leading their communal life. They once again noted the bishop's old age and poor health, which led him, so they claimed, to delegate the affair to his vicar who, I quote, for a reason that remains unknown, end of quote, disregarded his priestly obligation to care for the salvation of the Jewish girl's soul. Hence, the nuns requested that the provincial of their order look into the matter and should the girl persist in her wish to convert, have her baptized. Notwithstanding these arguments in favor of the Catholic faith and the salvation of the girl's soul, 
Alexander VI adhered to the stipulation <coughs> of canon law and dec decreed that Chiara Stella be returned to her Jewish parents and remain with them until she reached the age of consent, which was generally agreed to be 12 to 14 uh, for girls. The Pope did, however, grant the nuns their request to have their own provincial investigate the affair and examine Chiara Stella's willingness to convert once she reached reach this um, appropriate age. Whether or not this actually happened remains unknown because the papal brief is the latest document regarding the girl to have come to light so far. Now, Chiara Stella's story is an intriguing one in many respects. Still deemed a child and hence an individual whose greater impressionability could result in a more complete conversion to Christianity than that of adults who had been corrupted by many years of living as Jews. At age five, she was no longer a baby and could walk all the way to the convent and, while there, verbally express her wish to embrace Catholicism. According to her parents, she was lured by Christian neighbors who led her to the convent with sweet words. The neighbors rightly assumed that the nuns would know how to take care of a girl of Chiara Stella's age, because in 15th century Italy, virtually all convent chapters admitted girls from the age of five. Um, some of them were admitted as postulants, destined to become professed religious women, while others were placed in convents as boarders, in order to uh, learn proper Christian conduct, catechism, and basic skills, such as reading and sewing. Not only were girls of Chiara Stella's age not considered a disruptive presence in nunneries, but convent schooling, which blurred the distinction between elementary education and guardianship, actually constituted a major source of income for Renaissance nunneries. Convent schooling became increasingly important during the politically turbulent years of the 1480s, and especially out after the outbreak of the Italian Wars in 1494, so only two years uh, before Chiara Stella's bout in San Mateo. The documents pertaining to the attempted conversion of Chiara Stella have been known for some time and studied uh, mostly by Ariel, uh, by Ariel Toaf. Yet earlier studies have focused on their significance for understanding Jewish-Christian relations in Umbria, or Alexander VI's attitude toward forced conversion shortly after the expulsion of the Jews from Spain, and not on the light that they shed on nuns' activities as agents of conversion. Nonetheless, the dossier uh, detailing the case reveals that the nuns not only welcomed the Jewish girl into their community and strove to make her stay there an attractive alternative to life with her Jewish family, but also forcefully objected to the attempts to have her transferred to the care of a Christian laywoman. Seeing it as their responsibility to oversee her conversion, they presented the attempts to remove the girl from their convent as an offense which challenged their spiritual supremacy as the rise of Christ and their experience in supervising the devout upbringing of children who were trusted to their care. Furthermore, the nouns proudly affirmed that the Christian faith and religious devotion that they had instilled in Castella uh, were so durable that they enabled the girl to resist her parents' attempts to lure her back to Judaism after her relocation from the nunnery. Their praise of the girl's determination to become a Catholic was, of course, also meant to convince the Pope that while staying in San Mateo, and thanks to the spiritual counsel and pious example that they imparted on her, she had undergone a true conversio, change of heart. There is every reason to believe that the Bishop of Spoleto had initially consented to Chiara Stella staying in San Mateo, because before the Reformation, Italian bishops often placed Jews who contemplated conversion in nunneries, so female Jews who contemplated conversion. For instance, in 1470, the wife of a Jewish innkeeper fled from her wayward husband in Pavia, and the local bishop sent her to a convent, where she was to make up her mind whether or not she in fact, wish to embrace Christianity. In welcoming a prospective convert into their convent in Spoleta, though, the nuns of San Mateo were not merely obeying local religious authorities, but also acting upon their own strong commitment to the cause of converting the Jews. So when it became clear that the bishop and his vicar were not as keen um, to see the girls' conversion as they were, they did not hesitate to disobey their explicit orders putting their community in danger, in danger of excommunication. Ultimately, they turned to the Pope to secure the salvation of the soul of a child who had been entrusted to their care. 
The supplications of Sister Agatha and her sisters in religion provide a rare opportunity to re recover nuns' self-perception as agents of conversion. Yet many other kinds of sources enable us to get a sense of the importance that the ecclesiastical authorities ascribe to convents as the ideal settings for ensuring Jewish girls' successful conversion to Catholicism. Documentary evidence from the pre-Reformation era reveals that not only the Augustinian house of San Matteo, but also the Dominican convents of Santa Caterina Martire and Santa Caterina da Siena in Ferrara and the Benedictine house of Le Murati in Florence invested particular efforts in the endeavors to secure the successful conversion of Jewish girls. As is well known, the revitalization of the Catholic Church following the outbreak of the Protestant Reformation featured a zealous campaign to convert the Jews. In the era of Catholic restoration that began in the 1540s, some prelates continued to assign prospective converts to nunneries, while others expressed their concern that the presence of Jews would have a detrimental effect on religious women who were now expected to adhere to strict monastic enclosure aimed at ensuring their complete separation from worldly influence. The establishment of houses of catechumens, first in Rome and then in other cities, was meant to provide an alternative institutional solution for prospective female converts from Judaism. In 1543, Pope Paul III specifically ordered the establishment in Rome, I quote, of a convent for Jewish women and girls who had been baptized or wished to be baptized, and also the establishment of a house for the same categories of Jewish males, end of quote. The Pope's wording is instructive, not only because he addresses female converts before turning to their male counterparts, but also because he designates the institution that was meant to ensure uh, the baptism of girls and women as a convent, while referring to the one established for men simply as a house. The Pope's choice of words bears witness to the pivotal role that female religious communities had filled in facilitating Jewish conversion prior to the breakup of Western Christendom. So instrumental was their contribution to ensuring the conversion of Jewish girls and women that it led to the adoption of the convent as a model for an institution dedicated to overseeing the conversion of prospective female neophytes. Tellingly, once the Roman House of Catechumens began its operation, its female section was indeed arranged in a monastic format, whereas its male section was not modeled, it was not modeled on a monastery. But it took several decades before houses of catechumens began to operate in other major urban centers of central and northern Italy, and in some cities and towns the plans to establish them never materialized. In places in which no house of catechumens existed, nuns continued to be perceived as key converters, and their conversionary activities now had more marked disciplinary and coercive dimensions. Hence, in the mid-1550s, one inquisitor recommended assigning the daughters of Iberian conversos, conversos who arrived in Italian lands and were suspected of lapsing into Judaism to convents in order to ensure their orthodox upbringing away from the religiously suspect parents. In Venice in 1553, the neophyte Giovanni Giacomo di Fideli expressed his hope that, by impregnating his Jewish wife, he would secure her assignment to a nunnery, where she would have to be held until the birth and baptism of their baby, and in the meantime, he hoped, the nuns would succeed in convincing her to accept baptism. In Padua, the 10-year-old girl, Sarah Alcorn, was abducted in 1673 and taken to a convent for the preparations for her baptism after her brother had offered her to the church. The Bishop of Padua at the time of her baptism, Gregorio Barbarigo, enthusiastically favored sending prospective converts and neophytes to be educated in nunneries. This sent the Cardinal Bishop of Padua, who was um, officially beatified shortly after his death, hoped that convent education would culminate in the neophytes eventually opting for the monastic vocation. The Jewish girls that he sent to be brought up in nunneries were encouraged to take monastic vows, and at least three of them became nuns after their baptism, signaling Catholicism's ultimate triumph over Judaism. After the end of the last session of the Council of Trent in 1563, which emphasized the observance of complete enclosure as the primary obligation of professed religious women, other ecclesiastics had more of a trouble reconciling the efforts to augment the number of baptized Jews on the one hand 
and to reform female monastic institutions, on the other hand. In Florence, the tension between these two major goals of the church militant surfaced in 1583. Following the decision of Rabbi Yechiel de Pesaro to embrace Christianity, it was suggested in January of that year that since no house of catechumens was in operation in Florence at the that time, his wife and daughters, who refused to follow his lead, be placed in the nunnery. However, the reforming Archbishop of Florence, Alessandro Teviano de' Medici, um, future Pope Leo XI, expressly opposed the idea. Alessandro, the first Archbishop to implement the directives of the Council of Trent in Florentine religious houses by imposing architectural measures aimed at ensuring non-segregation from the rest of society, preferred sending the neophyte Jewish wife and daughters to stay with an upper-class family. As Giulio Antonio Santori, Cardinal of Santa Severina, explained in a letter, and I quote, it seemed more expedient to the Archbishop, out of respect that one should have for convents, that they, the baptized Jews kinswomen, stay in the house of his relatives, end of quote. Well, the baptism of six of Rabbi Yechiel's seven children was secured shortly after his own conversion. An assumption of uh, the Christian name Vitale Medici, his 18-year-old daughter, who could no longer be treated as a minor, was steadfast in her wish to remain a Jew. When it became clear that Archbishop Alessandro's assignment of the girl to a pious Christian family did not compel her to convert, Pope Gregory XIII came to the conclusion that she should be sent to a convent after all. On July 20, Marcantonio Maffei, Cardinal Secretary of Apostolic Briefs, informed the Medici Archbishop, I quote, the Lord Pope wishes you to have the Jewish daughter of Master Vitale, the neophyte physician, placed in one of the convents of Florence, so that maybe with the example of these mothers in the convent where she will be placed, she will make up her mind to console her father and imitate him by accepting the holy baptism." End of quote. I think that a wording here is very interesting. She has to uh, console her father by agreeing to be baptized. This letter, written at the behest of a pope who took a particular interest in Vitale Medici's conversion, stresses the pious comportment of nuns as a decisive factor in inducing a girl who resisted conversion to consent to baptism. While we do not know to which nunnery the girl was eventually sent, the papal orders to have her placed in a convent certainly produced the desired outcome. On October 14, Vitale informed um, Guglielmo Sirletto, Cardinal Protector of the Neophytes, that his eldest daughter agreed to convert and her catechizing was already underway. In less than three months, the nuns achieved an outcome that the devout Florentine family with whom she had stayed earlier had failed to accomplish. The last member of her family to be baptized unwillingly, Vitale's el eldest daughter received the sacrament on December 4 and was Christian Grazia. To conclude, I open this paper with the conversionary efforts of the nuns of San Matteo in Spoleto, whose supplications allow us to see how nuns framed their activities as agents of conversion almost half a century before the institutionalization of the missionary efforts to convert Italian Jews. I then argued that the adoption of the convent as a model for the institution designed to oversee the conversion of Jewish girls and women in 1543 <coughs> discloses an appreciative awareness of Nun's significant contribution to the efforts to convert the Jews before the Reformation. At the same time, the foundation of a specific institution charged with facilitating the conversion of female Jews also reflected the growing concern with Nun's separation from society. In the attempts to reform women's monastic communities in keeping with the dictates of the Council of Trent, some reformist prelates were willing to deprive nuns of the possibility to partake in a major religious campaign and to divest the church of important agents of conversion. Nonetheless, Pope Gregory's insistence on assigning Vitale Medici's daughter to a convent attests to the continuous awareness on the part of leading ecclesiastics of the unique opportunities that nunneries offer and provided for augmenting the number of Jewish converts. A century later, Bishop Gregorio Barbarigo likewise valued religious women who devoted their lives to God as perfectly suited not only for the task of caring for girls who were removed from their family, like Sarah Pon, 
but also for persuading reluctant converts that Catholicism is the true faith, providing a model of devout Catholic conduct, and imparting the tenets of Christianity. The peculiar physical setting in which Nuns' conversionary activities took place, namely gender homogeneous communities, set off from the rest of society, even if not uh, to the degree that uh, Puritan reformers uh, desired, undeniably contributed to the effectiveness of their persuasion, instruction, and undoubtedly also threats. The conversionary strategies that they employed in specific cases remain shrouded in obscurity, but the documents surrounding Grazia de' Medici's faith make it clear that these were indeed potent and were highly esteemed as effective by prelates, prelates at the highest level of the ecclesiastical hierarchy well into the era of Catholic revival. Thank you. Tomar, uh, the second speaker is, is my colleague and f friend, uh, Dr. Karen Abu Hershkovitz, who is a postdoctoral here in, in the center. She's uh, uh, interested in the transition of knowledge, theories, text, and, and people. She published a paper discussing the transmission of science and currently working on the on the emotional and gen gender gender aspects of conversion in the Muslim world. Karen, please. In this paper, I will add my voice to the debate whether or not women in 7th century Arabia had, had agency. By looking at women's impact on specific cases of conversion, I will challenge the view that women's position in, the, in early Islam was marginal and passive, being little more than property switching hands. I regard this view as a misconception because it considers women's agency to be found only where extraordinary women are. Who, uh, women there who overcame strict cultural boundaries or broke social norms. Um, and I think that's, uh, this assumption um, leads us to, to avoid and have to change this perspective. I suggest a different conception, one that acknowledges the agency of women who worked within accepted social boundaries and yet demonstrated independence of mind and activity. Seen from this perspective, a Muslim tradition depicts women not only as newly converted Muslims, but also as advocates of the new religion and its message. Um, contributing to the construction of the emerging community. We should do that by looking into stories of conversion, where women took part in the process of another person's conversion. We have several episodes where we know of women's conversion being followed by another. A mother converting and then her daughters um, uh, convert, or sometimes the other way around, a daughter converts and then her mother uh, joins her. Uh, cases where a mother wishes to give allegiance to the Prophet, to the Prophet Muhammad, uh, on behalf of her daughter. And even one case of a mother wishing to uh, uh, convert her unborn child. She's pregnant and she's coming to the Prophet. She uh, converts, she acknowledges his, uh, his uh, uh, prophecy and wants to do the same for her uh, baby. Um, uh, there are also cases where uh, some information disclosed by a woman is followed by a listener's conversion. For instance, the conversion of Hamza, Muhammad's paternal uncle, was triggered by a woman who witnessed an episode where Abu Jahal, one of uh, Muhammad's uh, opponents, bothered Muhammad. He, uh, this woman heard of, uh, of this and she, she, she was eavesdropping to this uh, conversation and when the Hamza returned she told him what happened. He got really mad and he went after uh, Abu Jahal, hit him hard on his head and told him that now he is a Muslim and if he ever wants to pick on a Muslim he should choose him. Well, that's uh, one way of choosing uh, Islam. Let us look at um, uh, an incident where things are less circumstantial. Uh, and I suggest to look at the story of uh, a woman named Um Hakim and the conversion of her husband, Ikrama ibn Abi Jahl. In this story, you have a woman speaking with her own voice and also a woman who is presented as acting on her own behalf. 
Ikraman and his father um, were among Muhammad's fiercest enemies. His father died in the year of uh, 624 after uh, one of the um, fiercest battles Muhammad had uh, with the people of Mecca. Um, Ikraman didn't die, but he remained a very fierce uh, enemy and antagonistic to Muhammad's proph prophecy and mission. And also, now he wanted to avenge the death of uh, his father. Um, finally, in the year 630, Muhammad conquered Mecca. At the, and when he uh, entered Mecca at, at 630, he wished to clean the city from um, uh, the idol. And many of the <coughs> present were either they either convert, chose to convert or to leave Mecca. Um, Ikrama fled Mecca, but his wife, Um Hakim, decided to convert. After once she did that by uh, joining a group of, uh, of women who entered Muhammad's tent, they, um, they pronounced their uh, acceptance of uh, his new religion. And after she did that, she addressed Muhammad and she told him that she wants him to allow her husband to return to Mecca and uh, choose whether he wants to, to join the new, um, uh, new uh, religion, new community. Uh, Muhammad said, okay, do it, and she went after her husband. She found him, she was on a camel, riding through the desert, and found him boarding a ship to the Yemen. Um, she told him that Muhammad has given, given him safe conduct, and she suggested that he should come back. He was not sure at first, but then she said, don't worry, he's a good man, he's a man of his word, please come back. And he finally decided that he's okay, he's coming back. Um, but she wouldn't let him uh, come near her or touch her because she said that now she's a Muslim and he is not allowed to, to, to be her, or her uh, to, to have intercourse with her or uh, uh, be, have any, any physical relation uh, with her. Um, but he returned to, uh, to Mecca and he decided he, that he is going to be a Muslim now and their marriage were reinstated after his conversion. Now it's a good question whether Um Hakim's uh, actions were the direct reason for Ikrama's conversion. The events and exchanges between Ikrama and Um Hakim are probably part of a topos rather than conveying actual events pertaining to Muhammad's benevolence and treatment of his uh, former enemies. But even if it isn't a topos, even if it is, of, um, it is of significance to take into account that medieval authors included women in leading roles within this topos. And of course, but we can read similar cases. For instance, the, the story right after uh, uh, this particular story in uh, Al Waqili's uh, Kitab al Ma'azi is a very similar story where another one of Muhammad's great enemies, a Sufyan uh, ibn Umayya, left on the day of the conquest of Mecca and he is followed by another messenger who suggests that he should uh, return to Mecca and he promised him, promises him safe conduct. but. Sufyan is not convinced and he wants to have different reassurances and different promises. It takes a while of persuasion until he uh, agrees to do that. Um, but what is more interesting uh, for that, for us, um, is, is not the fact that uh, he was persuaded or not persuaded, but the fact that we uh, said, or I said earlier that um, uh, um Hakim went with a group of women to give Muhammad's, uh, to, to, to uh, give uh, the bayah, the oath of alliance. One of the women with her was one of uh, uh, Sufyan's wives. She said nothing, or at least she's not credited by uh, medieval authors with saying anything on behalf of her husband or trying to change uh, her husband's uh, uh, faith. So, if we return to the question of what we can say is the relation between Um Hakim's actions and Ikrama's conversion, well, probably there was some connection. She was there, she uh, negotiated uh, for her husband, she convinced her, she wrote after her husband, it's 
um, also something that we should uh, take into account. And she convinced her husband to trust her and Muhammad, and she put herself in different kinds of danger in, on behalf of uh, her husband, and it, the eventual outcome is his conversion. Well, even though when reading it, it seems very really convincing, well, of course she had something to do with his conversion, but when I first read it, I, could, I heard this little voice saying, well, it might also be not good enough. So I looked for something else. I was asking myself, what would be good enough? Good enough would be a woman that is actually speaking about beliefs or concepts, and she's talking directly about conversion. So I looked for uh, episodes depicting actual discussion pertaining to conversion that resulted in the listener's conversion. And I found several such cases. For instance, according to one version, the conversion of Omar ibn al-Khattab, the second um, caliph and a very prominent member of the early Islamic uh, community, Muhammad's, uh, one of Muhammad's closest uh, uh, companions, was triggered by conversation with his sister. She gave him a piece of paper with verses of the Quran and she instructed him to purify himself before reading them. Uh, the written text had profound effect on, on Omar and he eventually converted. Furthermore, there's a story of Um Shariq <coughs> al-Amaria, who actively proselytized among Qurayshi women, the uh, um, tribe of, uh, of Mecca, and invited them to join Islam. It is told that she used to go to the field and go to women who were working and walking around and call them to convert. In another case, Um Sulaim was responsible for at least two conversions. According to Ibn Sa'd, we have uh, the story uh, here, Um Sulaim believed in the messenger of Allah and Abu Anas, Abu Anas was uh, her husband, came. He had been absent, he said, have you become a heretic? She said, I have not become a heretic, I have believed in this man. I have begun to teach Anas, their son. I told him to say there is no God but Allah and to say I testify that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. He did that. His father said to her, do not corrupt my son for me. She said, I am not corrupting him. Well, her husband, as you may imagine, was not very happy with this whole thing. I'm not sure what made him less happy, her conversion or her son being somehow maneuvered into um, Islam. But the, sh the story cuts very short here, and we don't know what happens to him. He dies, and she decides that she will not marry anybody else until her, her son tells her to get married. It's, it's a toddler at this point, because she said that she will have to wean him first. So I'm not sure how weaning and telling her to marry somebody is related, but interesting that this is her lines. And um, some time later, a person approaches her, Abu Talha, and tells her that he wants to marry her, and she refuses. Some time passes, and she tells him, are you sure you have the, the story um, on, the, on the slide here? To paraphrase it, she tells him, are you sure you really believe that a stone, a stick, or uh, anything that has no actual life, something that you give a carpenter or uh, a smith and he makes a shape from it. Can you really believe that this has any influence on your life? And he tells her that what she says entered her heart, his heart, and he is he now believes in um, in uh, God and he wants to become a Muslim. And then she calls her son and tells him, "Get up." Unless you have to marry me, and they get married. Um, not all such conversions or, or such uh, uh, speeches or discussions end up with, with actual conversion. For instance, Awa, and here I want to make a short comment. Um, I was looking for, uh, for a family tree of uh, Muhammad, and I spent hours doing that. And there aren't, there, there was one 
but not a very good one, that has the uh, aunts of Muhammad. All of them has the male relatives, no, almost no female relatives. This one is slightly better because you have, if you look here, there's this small thing. It says that there are six other uh, aunts, and, um, male and female relatives that are not mentioned. So I corrected this um, yeah, injustice and added Awa here. Um, Abu Lahab was uh, her, um, her brother and one of uh, Muhammad's uh, paternal um, uncles. Uh, she tried, Abu Lahab was one of um, uh, Muhammad's also, um, um, they, they had their disagreements, if to put it um, mildly. He, he was uh, very much opposed to uh, uh, Muhammad. And she told Abu Lahab that he should convert, arguing that this is his familiar obligation and the right thing to do. It didn't work. Um, this, this, the same Awa converted in a very similar way. Her son, Tulayb, uh, came, came to her and told her that he uh, converted. And she answered, by Allah, if we were able to do what men do, we would follow him and defend him, Tulayb said. And what prevents you, mother, from becoming Muslim and following him? Your brother, Hamza, Hamza we spoke about a few minutes ago, um, had already uh, become a Muslim. Then she said, I will see what my sisters are doing, and then I will be one of them. In other words, both Tulayb and his mother use similar lines of, of argumentation to motivate conversion. Reading other conversion stories demonstrate that women are not much different than men in the way they are described as motivating conversion. All this story that I have mentioned, you can find male figures doing pretty much the same thing, talking about similar ideas or using the same practices. What does that mean? I think it mainly means that deep down inside I was expecting a different picture. Perhaps to find unique typologies where women are attributed with different means to motivate others to convert. I think that one of the things that I, was, that I had in mind was the story of Zainab, Muhammad's uh, daughter, who um, also somehow re related to her husband's conversion, but she did that by being there, by being uh, a wife by waiting patiently for him to finally see the light. This, if you Google uh, Zainab Muhammad's uh, daughter, you will probably find these uh, very nice um, uh, descriptions of one of Islam's greatest love stories. Love story, she waits for a very long time, and then they join back together to be uh, married. But all, this, all the episodes I just described don't really <coughs> fall into a category of passiveness or, or just em emotional appeals or waiting for somebody else to do something. I would argue um, that these women were probably not defying the wor world order, but they were not waiting for things to happen either. They made things happen. Within the boundaries of their world, they were creating their own reality. When we look for agency in actions of defiance and resistance, or when we assume the direct line between agency and freedom, it leads us to ignore a whole world of proactive women. These women worked within the boundaries of their society, but nonetheless they worked on their own behalf and strove to change their lives or set course for their lives and their relatives. Um, but I would like to end with a um, somewhat different story. Uh, the story of the conversion of uh, Rifa ibn Samawal. In the year 627, Muhammad decided to, to uh, kill or um, uh, send away uh, um, one of the tribes, one of the Jewish tribes of uh, Medina, the Banu Khuwaiza, they were accused of disloyalty. The Rifam asked, Rifa was, was a member of this uh, Jewish uh, tribe, and he asked Um Salama, Muhammad's uh, maternal aunt, to give him safe conduct. 
she agreed because they had very good relations both with, he had good relations with her and with her brothers it is not clear why he addressed her or what is exactly what it means exactly these uh, good uh, uh, relations and she uh, told uh, Muhammad that she wishes to give safe conduct to Rifa Muhammad agrees and says yes he is for you Rifa was saved a while later um, um Salama sent word to Muhammad saying, O oh, Messenger of God, he will pray with me and eat the flesh of camel. That is, Rifa abandoned the uh, commandments of uh, Judaism and he is accepting this, the new ideas of uh, Islam. Muhammad was skeptic and answered, If he prays, it is good for him, but if he stays in his religion, it is evil for him. I think it also answers one of the comments that we had earlier about the different aspects of conversion and different acts demonstrating uh, conversion. And then some time passes and she says, he has converted. Muhammad accept, accepts um, uh, Rifa's um, um, conversion to be genuine and he is now a Muslim. But this is not the interesting part. The interesting part is the aftermath of Rifa's conversion. It reaches Salama's ears that Rifa was being taunted and was called her protege, her maula, as was the common social understanding of giving safe conduct. So she called him and said to him, Indeed, by God, I am not your mistress, but I spoke to the messenger of God and he gave you to me. I spare your blood and you have your lineage. So you see, in a world where a woman saves a man from certain or almost certain death, helps him to see the light and join the true religion, she is still not entitled to enjoy the social benefits of um, all, all these actions. Um, the stories mentioned above demonstrate that women were an integral part of the emerging Islamic community not only by joining it as followers, but also as agents of conversion. Their methods were diverse, and they were not restricted to passivity. Of course, we should not take these stories of at face value. It may be that Um Sharik never even existed. It is also possible that most of these stories are no more than, than topoi, attributing actions and words to fictional figures. Nonetheless, the fact that authors considered it plausible to include women, women and female figures in their narrative demonstrate that at least some of the readers of these uh, narratives considered it possible to have such women. Thank you, Karen. And the next speaker is Dr. Uri Simonson who is a lecturer in the Department of Middle Eastern History in Haifa University and, and is a member of, of our center. He, he, he published several articles on, on topics such as extra-confessional litigation, conversion to Islam, intermarriage, and, and, and legal and his, his Choreographic ad adaptation in the context of interreligious encounters. Please. Okay, um, hello everyone. Uh, I think this is the first time that I have ever experienced a real spoiler in the context of a, an academic uh, uh, conference. Um, and uh, if I was uh, worried, I, earlier I joked with Karen that uh, maybe one of us should step down because we're about to say the same things. Well, I didn't realize how close I was to the truth. So I'm afraid you're going to have to bear with another 20 or so minutes with uh, almost the same stories and maybe very slightly different observations. <laughs> The theme of our conference, titled Agents of Conversion, presupposes the concept of agency as denoting the capacity of one individual to motivate or induce another to perform an action, namely to convert to Islam. Yet the term agency does not lend itself to the idea of cause and effect in the context of human interactions, but rather stresses the autonomous capacities of the individual's self. Instead, I find the concept of power 
to be better suited for the assessment of moments in which individuals caused, drove, affected, or inspired others to adopt new spiritual convictions. My approach is a Foucauldian one, namely that power is everywhere, diffused and embodied in discourse, knowledge, and what Foucault termed as regimes of truth. According to Foucault, power manifests itself through accepted forms of knowledge, which in turn acquire a quality of truth. Foucault argues that each society has its regime of truth, that, it, that is types of discourse which it accepts and makes function as true. Put differently, we are dealing with the power to imbue matters with truth by means of discourse. The mere capacity to do so, in itself a form of agency, was possessed by a narrow group of individuals whose sayings count as true thanks to their cultural capital. The two sources of discursive power, which I shall be discussing today, are biographic narratives and the heroes, or better said, the heroines, whose sayings were recorded in these narratives. The heroines to whom I'm referring are the Sahabiyat, that is, the female companions of the Prophet, the first female Muslim believers. These women played important social roles as wives, mothers, and even as sisters which, among other things, endow them with the means to draw their kinfolk towards the Muslim fold and enhance their confessional fidelity. At the same time, later, later records describing the careers of these women could be seen to have possessed a similar quality of power vis-à-vis -vis future generations of, Muslim, of women. In presenting Sahabiyat as role models, as heroines whose careers were inscribed in a constantly evolving Islamic memory of a formative past, these records could serve to induce later generations of Muslim women to make use of their social capitals in the context of conversion to Islam. My point, then, my point is then that early and medieval Islamic narratives on Sahabiyat offer images of female power. These images allow us to assess the potential of female power in the course of the formation of the community of believers and throughout medieval Islamic history. In my talk today, I shall restrict myself to the question of female power in the context of conversion to Islam during the time of the Prophet, a historical, a historical moment which was to set an example for future generations of Muslims. To that end, and I will focus on a sample of biographic entries about Sahabiyat whose careers are recorded in these collections. These biographies relating to the lives of individuals from the time of the Prophet and on vary in length and content, but also share some common traits in terms of matter and style. We are dealing with a massive body of biographies of men and women whose careers were deemed worthy of recording, owing, among other things, to their prominent role information of the community of believers. Methodologically speaking, the historiographic utility of these biographies is open for debate. Scholars are, who are inclined towards attributing historical veracity to reports about the first Muslims will find them useful for reconstructing snapshots of social reality from the time of the Prophet. Others, however, who might be more skeptical about the reliability of these stories, may choose to consider biographies as models of normative conduct that were to take, to take form during the time they were put into writing, namely not before the end of the 8th century. Accordingly, they treat biographies as vessels of communal memory, at times modified and adapted to meet later concerns. In the tribal society of Arabia of the 7th century, marriage was a social institution of utmost importance as it not only served to affirm or facilitate new social alliances, but also operated as a microcosm hub of social ideals and sentiments. These included a gendered hierarchy that placed the husband atop a gradually expanding kinship pyramid and his wife in a state of dependence and subordination. Yet within gender-defined normative limitations, women do appear to have possessed social power. The story about Um Hakim and her husband Ikrama bin Abi Jahl, a famous Muslim leader and companion of the Prophet, is one case in point. 
early historiographic accounts, akhbar, and traditions, hadith from the end of the 8th century, speak of Umm Hakim as, one, as the one responsible for her husband's conversion to Islam. Thus, in the biography of the Prophet, edited in the late 8th, early 9th century by Ibn Hisham, Umm Hakim is reported to have embraced Islam and later obtained from the Prophet security for her husband Ikrimah. Although still an infidel, she then went after Ikrimah, who had fled to Yemen, brought him back to Mecca, where he embraced Islam, and the couple's marriage was reaffirmed by the Prophet. The Muwatta, the 8th century hadith collection of Malik ibn Anas, contains a report according to which Umm Hakim embraced Islam on the day Mecca was taken by the Muslims in 630, whereupon Ikrimah fled to Yemen. Umm Hakim followed him there and called upon him to accept the Islamic faith, which he did. In another report from the late 8th, early 9th century, the historiographic treatise of Al-Waqidi, the Kitab al-Tarif wal-Maghazi, Book of History and Campaigns, Umm Hakim is counted among 12 famous Qurayshi women who converted on the day of the conquest of Mecca. In the course of the encounter between these women and the Prophet, Umm Hakim is reported to have asked the Prophet to grant security to her husband who had fled to Yemen out of fear for his life. The Prophet agreed, whereupon Umm Hakim set out after her husband. When they met, Umm Hakim informed Ikrimah that she has obtained his security from the Prophet. Sometime later, Ikrimah sought to reunite with Umm Hakim to which she responded, you are an infidel and I am a Muslim. The two were seated by the Prophet and Ikrimah, having verified that his wife obtained his security, was persuaded by the correctness of the Prophet's message and finally embraced Islam as well. The kernel of these depictions appears in contemporary hadith and later collections. Its early attestation in a biogra biographic notice is found in a biography devoted to Ikrima in Ibn Sa'd's late 8th, early 9th century collection. Numerous biogra biographic collections refer to the event, again, all under an entry devoted to Ikrima. These entries are significantly shorter than the historiographic report given by Wakili, by all make note of Ikrimah's conversion thanks to his wife. The recurring depiction of Umm Hakim's successful attempt to bring about the conversion of her husband makes particular notice of Umm Hakim's initiative and independence. Her appearance before Muhammad lobbying in favor of her husband, her travel all the way to Yemen after him, and her condition that he converts to Islam so they may reunite all support and image of a resourceful woman thanks to which her religious mission succeeds. Similar attempts to bring male spouses into the Muslim fold show up in the case of Umm Sulaim, mother of Anas bin Malik, a well-known companion of the Prophet and narrator of prophetic traditions. Umm Sulaim's abilities are not restricted to her efforts regarding her two husbands, however, but also bear relevance to the upbringing of her son, thus illustrating her crucial maternal responsibilities as well. Umm Sulaim gave birth to Anas while married to Malik bin al -Nawr. Malik died and Umm Sulaim then married Abu Talha al-Ansari, a famous companion of the Prophet, for whom she gave birth to another boy. She is said to have embraced the faith of the Prophet while she was pregnant with her second child. According to a report found in Ibn Sa'd, Sa'd's late uh, uh, 8th, early 9th century collection of biographies, Umm Sulaim converted to Islam while her husband Malik was away from home. Upon his return, Malik asked her whether she had been behaving in a childish manner during his absence, to which she responded that she has not, but that she believes in that man, referring to the Prophet. Umm Sulaim then began to instruct her first son, Anas, and guide him through the proclamation of the Shahada. Her husband warned her not to corrupt his son, to which Umm Sulaim responded that she is not corrupting the boy. At this point, we are informed that the husband, father, left and was shortly after killed by an adversary, a report to which Umm Sulaim reacted with indifference and a statement that she will not wean Anas until he lets go of her breast and will not marry until he, her son, orders her to do so. Anas is then reported to have said later on, I have consumed what she had, whereupon he let go of her breast. At this point, another man, Abu Talha, 
betrothed Um Sulaim, yet having been a polytheist, Um Sulaim refused to marry him. She then said to him, Did you see the stone which you worship? Does it harm or benefit you? Or a tree which the carpenter forms for you? Does it harm or benefit you? Um Sulaim's words had a strong impact on um Abu Talha, whereupon he embraced Islam. She then said, I shall marry you, but not take from you a dowry in addition to your conversion. A different version of the story appears in Ibn Abd al-Bar's 11th century collection. Here we are told that Um Sulaim had converted to Islam along with her tribe and suggested to her husband to do so as well. He, in response, was angry with her and left for Syria where he died. She was then approached by Abu Talha who betrothed her while she was a polytheist. When he realized that the only way to marry her is by embracing Islam, he conver converted and married her. The account makes no mention of Anas as a child. Similar versions to the one given in Ibn Sa'ad's early collection are found in later ones, including in the late 12th, early 13th century collection of Ibn al athir which contains a biography devoted to Abu Talha, Um Sulaim's second husband, and in a separate biography devoted to Um Sulaim herself. Abu Talha betrothed Um Sulaim, at which point she said to him, O oh, Abu Talha, someone like you cannot be turned down, but you are a polytheist and I am a Muslim woman. It is forbidden for me to marry you, but if you become a Muslim, this will be my marriage gift, and I shall not ask you for another. Consequently, Abu Talha converted to Islam, and the act was regarded as Um Sulaim's marriage gift. At the same time, in his 15th century collection, the renowned Ibn Hajar notes an alternative report according to which Um Sulaim advised Abu Talha that she should not marry before her first time Anas will mature and attend scholarly sessions, majalis, about which Anas remarked that his mother was repaid by God on his account, for she took good care of him. Um Sulaim's ability to resist the reproach of her first husband and bring out the conversion to Islam over a second are noteworthy, of course, and offer us yet another example of a woman who was able to challenge the gender hierarchies that were imposed by the marital conventions of her time. Yet Um Sulaim's heroic figure is bolstered even further when it comes to her zealous attitude towards the upbringing of her son. She defies her first husband by insisting on Islam, his Islamic education, sacrifices her own well-being by continuing to breastfeed him while after his infancy, um, well after his infancy, and by refusing to remarry until the child concedes to it. Um Sulaim then exemplifies qualities of both agency and power. She acts in an agent, as an agent of free will in the sense that she gives up her material mahr and is able to defy her, her, uh, defy her first husband. At the same time, she exerts power when she drives her second husband to conversion. It should be also noted, however, that in some of the stories, she treats her minor child, Anas, as her guardian, whose concern for her marriage is required according to some Sunni schools. In this sense, she does not play down gender hierarchies, but actually conforms to them, or even goes out of her way to emphasize them. Accordingly, she is presented as a strong woman, who acts out of her own will, but not against male hegemony. In addition to her actions, her dialogue with her two husbands revealed the strengths of her character and her assertive stance. Women who would learn about Um Sulaim's courageous figure could find reassurance in her son's statement, recorded in Ibn Hajar's collection, that, she, that his mother was rewarded by God thanks to her diligent care. Another example, of a woman whose mothering role rendered her spiritual mission significant is that of the Arab poetess at Khansa. She is recorded to have arrived in Medina around 629 in order to embrace Islam. According to the 10th century report of Abu al-Faraj al-Isfahani in a volume dedicated to accounts of women poets within his Kitab al ghani the Book of Songs, she was with her four sons when they were killed in the Battle of Qadisiyah in 636. On the evening prior to the battle, El Khansa is reported to have exalted her boys. My sons, you have embraced Islam in obedience and have migrated 
that is to Medina, Medina, out of your own choice. You should know that the next abbot is a finer one than the present. Be patient and vie you, vie you in patience. Be steadfast, for God, happily so, will prosper. This is taken from Surat al Imran, verse 200. The following morning, Al Khansa's sons set out to the battle, moving forward one by one, citing verses, bearing in mind the old woman's exhortation, until one after the other they lost their lives in combat. The news about their death was delivered to Al Khansa, whereupon she said, Praise God who, who honored me with their killing. I ask my Creator to unite me with them. The very same report is given in later biographic compilations, only in greater detail, including the verses which the boys cited in praise of their mother and her encouragement as they set out to battle. The absence of a father figure in this story is striking. The narrator is concerned strictly with the relationship between the mother and her children. The mother's religious devotion is depicted most vividly as she sends her, babe, her boys to, the, to their death and praises God for her loss. Her strong figure and its impact on her son's motivation is anything but, but insinuated as they carried her words while engaging in battle, reciting her poetry, which they've learned by heart. The protective role of a mother serves to advance spiritual truth vis-a-vis -vis immediate and secondary blood relations in the story about Arwa bin Abdul Mutalib, the Prophet's paternal aunt. The affair provides a vivid depiction of the family feuds resulting from Muhammad's mission. Arwa's biography in Ibn Sa'id's collection reports that Abu Jahl, one of Muhammad's greatest Meccan adversaries, along with a group of Qurayshi polytheists, contrived to assault the Prophet. To his defense came out Arwa's son, Tulal, who approached Abu Jahl and struck him, afflicting him pain. Tulai was then taken by Abu Jahl's clan, but later rescued by Arwa's brother, Abu Lahab, who despite his polytheistic inclinations, felt responsible for his nephew. The Qurayshi adversaries then turned to Arwa and asked her, did you see how your son gave himself in support of Muhammad? To which she responded, blessed be, blessed be his day, for he defended his cousin, cousin, and this truly came from Allah. They said, have you become a follower of Muhammad? To which he replied in the affirmative. The Qurayshis then went to Arwa's brother Abu Lahab, asking that he would intervene. He turned to Arwa and said, it is better that you don't follow Muhammad and remain in the faith of Abdul Muttalib. To which he replied, this has, our ha this has already happened. Then go and support your nephew. You may choose to enter with him, accept Islam, or remain in your faith. Should he be hurt, you should be excused on account of your nephew. Among the later versions of the story, the one given by Ibn Hajar offers a different perspective as to how matters evolved. According to Arwa's biography in Ibn Hajar's collection, it was first her son, Tulai, that had embraced Islam. He then went to his mother in order to inform her of his acts and asked her to pre what prevents her from doing the same. Arwa responded that she will first inquire with her brothers, yet giving her son's encouragement, decided to embrace Islam as well. Following the dispute between the, the Qurayshi polytheist and her son, and her attempt to bring her brother Abu Lahab in the Muslim, into the Muslim fold, Abu Lahab asked her, our strength among, is among the Arabs, and he, Muhammad, has introduced a new religion. To this, Arwa responded with the following poetic verse. To life supported his cousin and gave him comfort with his blood and wealth. The message here strikes ambivalent. Both sides seem to emphasize familiar family relations, only each comes to a different conclusion. Arwa and her son emphasize blood relations and their cousin Muhammad as a reason to defend him and to convert to Islam, whereas Abu Lahab and Abu Jahl emphasize that Muhammad's actions are causing harm to the family and are therefore reprehensible. Abu Hajar's account, noting that the, the son's precedence over his mother's in conversion to Islam, his effort to draw her to the Muslim fold, and his courageous siding with, uh, with the Prophet could be seen a later attempt to belittle our figure. Yet throughout the affair, 
in its early and later depictions, the protective image of will-powered Agua holding out against the violent pressures of our pagan kinfolk should not escape our attention. It reminds us once again of the negotiations of power between converts and their former co-religionist family members, and the resistance offered by women to the gender hierarchy to which they were expected to submit. The participants of this conference should be advised about the ongoing and unresolved debate among Islamicists as to whether reports about the time of the Prophet and the early Muslim community can be trusted whether they should be taken as accurate depictions of events or literary interpolations that were meant to suit later agendas. To my mind, this debate is immaterial once we take historiographic accounts as a discursive memorabilia that was dictated by assumptions about normative contingencies. Early accounts were put into writing roughly a century and a half after the events they were recording. Accordingly, they were within safe chronological proximity to the early phases of Islamic emergence in order to report a social reality that was perceived within the bounds of probability. At the same time, later reports, modified as they were, could appeal to the minds of later Muslim generations in the context of their, so their own social conventions. These reports, I wish to argue, were to operate as conduits of truth which operated within the so-called Foucauldian regimes of truth. They possessed a discursive power that served to shape and mold perception of prior and contemporary experiences. At the same time, so did the female heroines at their center. The marvelous, at time exaggerated, agency of these women was to imbue their discourse with power as they were looked upon for guidance and example by future generations of Muslim women in the course of a continuously expanding Muslim community. Their story thus betray a strong tension between conformity to gender hierarchy, which, it, which is, of course, exalted in Islam, and between their agency in choosing to follow the Prophet. Their agency, coupled with that of the literary accounts about them, was to furnish their power or that of the or that of the recorded images to inspire others. Thank you. Thank you to Uri. Uh, I, I I would like to call our respondent uh, Moshe Sluchowski, with a, a, a poet and Claude Kelman chair in the study of French Jews at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He serves as the chair of the department of the of of his. Of, of History and of Institute of, of History at the Hebrew University. He has written a number of books and textbooks on, on religions, religious history, such as Patroness of, of Paris, Rituals of Devotion in Late Medieval and Early Modern France. Thank you very much. <coughs> And thank you for uh, inviting me here, and I'm sorry I couldn't attend the uh, first two days of the conference. I was busy in other conferences. And I assume that everything I'm going to say has already been said, uh, either in papers or in, in comments, uh, so bear with me. Um, so we just have three papers, and in these three papers we encountered two uh, religious cultures, but basically similar questions concerning gender agency and devotion. As uh, we've seen, uh, Abu Ashkaritz and Simonson both discuss the same body of sources, namely stories about early Muslim female followers of the Prophet, and these women's role in converting husbands, children, and others. Well, Helsic takes us to Mal. Why don't you sit here? Yeah. Well, to Mal, uh, Helsic um, takes us a thousand years forward to the Italian peninsula and to announce initiatives in converting Jews. So we have Christians and Jews and Muslims and pagans all make appearances in one panel, which is a wonderful achievement for the organizer, which is a major headache uh, for a commentator. And what I've chosen to do was to talk in very, very general um, terms. So obviously, uh, Abu Hashkaritz is right when she argues that when we look for agency solely in actions of defiance and resistance, or when we assume a direct link between agency and freedom, we ignore a whole universe of proactive women. These women worked within the boundaries of their um, societies and never tried to reshape them, 
but nonetheless, within the space allocated to them, they worked on their own behalf and strove to change their lives or set a course for their lives and for the lives of others. And indeed, the specific historical agencies that are the topics of all three presentations obviously remained within the boundaries of patriarchy and did not try to resist it or to recreate society. And as such, the agency is obviously different from modern liberal feminist notions of subjecthood and agency. So I want to emphasize two characteristics of early Islamic agency and late medieval monastic agency or female agency that distinguish them, I think, significantly from modern, modern notions of agency. Uh, the first, of course, is their context. In all three cases, the women involved acted not in order to enhance the convert's individual modern liberal notion of agency or subjecthood, but rather the opposite, to convince them to submit to authority. The Muslim converts themselves, the Christian nuns, and their targeted audiences of pagans and Jews were to act out and gain agency by submitting to a divine authority which was mediated by the converting women. The protagonists wanted their followers to desire to subjugate themselves to a greater power just as they themselves had already done. One can even argue that by converting others and igniting in them the desire to connect with God, the converters find consolation and affirmation of their own previous decision to renounce family or marriage or religion. Another major aspect of these agentic stories or dramas is their self-transformative -transform impact. Conversion is both a death and a rebirth. A person is shedding skin and being reborn as new. And here Simonson's Foucauldian vocabulary is very useful. Conversion is a drama of the imposition of a new regime of truth. According to Foucault, power manifests itself through accepted forms of knowledge, which in turn acquire quality of truth. But Foucault always lacked a theory of historical change. And in the, in, in, in the presentations we just heard, we encountered dramas of transition. Conversion is a transition. We're talking about conflictual regimes in the plural of truth, in the plural, in which one group of people is speaking on behalf of one truth, while another invokes a separate or competing regime of truth. It is far from clear where does power lie in these cases. Power in both the abstract Foucauldian sense in the very concrete one as in Erzik's case study. Um, so the relations, I think it's worth thinking about the relation between agency and power regime of truth uh, in moments uh, of transition such as conversion. One would have expected the truth promoted by women to be less valued and less authoritative than a truth articulated and promoted by men and by tradition. And in fact, I suggest that rather than celebrating these precious moments of female agency, we should point out, we should pay attention to the effect that agency in all of these cases is permitted only as so far as it leads to submission and even enhance to enhances enhance enhance submission to an authority that is masculine. One can read the Muslim stories there, as Simonson reminds us, as records not of what actually happened, but of what some Muslim men wanted to teach about women and their agency. Men always had the discursive power and the power of the pen. And the question then is not whether women had agency, but rather why did some Muslim men, when coming to describe the beginning of their own faith, made a con unconscious decision to describe some women a significant amount of power or agency. And the answer, as I've already pointed out, should be, I assume, that what was not worthy, what was noteworthy about this woman was not their individual agency, but the early realization that submission to the prophets, teaching and to God, rather than, rather than making individual choices, is the road to salvation. 
The agency was not the freedom to do what one wanted, but the freedom to want to do what was right. And what was right was defined not by these women, but by the religious system, namely by the prophet himself and his male interpreters. And I can think of some explanations that have been given in the uh, history of, uh, of the role of women in, in conversion and Christianity. Women is uh, emotional, uh, women is closer to God because they are more spiritual and less material. Uh, all kinds of, of, of large um, explanatory um, paradigms. Uh, I am not familiar enough uh, with Islam and with scholarship about Islam to know to what degree uh, we also have uh, some sort of um, large uh, scheme of speculation about what was going on there. Hatch's documents are different. They were written not only by men but also by some women themselves. Granted, these women, the nuns, were writing two male clerics in positions of authority from the bishop all the way to the pope. In each of the letters, they were affirming and even by the act of writing the letters, they were affirming their total submission to the existing gender and societal order. The nuns, the nuns proudly pointed out that the Christian faith and religious devotion that they had instilled in the Jewish, in the Jewish girl in one of the cases uh, uh, were so durable uh, that they enabled the girl to resist her parents' attempts to lure her back to Judaism um, but here too, their claim was rejected on behalf of a larger male designated and male designed um, hierarchical order. So all of this being said, I want to end with a major paradox of religious and devotional agency that hold true regardless of gender, but I think is uniquely crucial in cases of gender. Religious cultures promote their own sense of freedom that marks how different it is from secular modern notions of agency. Writing in the early years of the 17th century, but echoing the 5th century, St. Augustine, Francois de Sales, one of the most important theologians of his generation, described the Catholic, what I would say, the Christian or maybe religious notion of liberty as follows. Our free will is never as free as when it is enslaved to the will of God, nor even is enslaved as when it serves our own will. It never has so much life and when it dies for itself, and never so much death as when it lives for itself. End quote. Trying to make sense of religious women agentic possibilities I suggest we should never forget that agency is a modern ideal and not necessarily a transhistorical one. Thank you all. Thank you. We can now open the session for questions and, and comments. Uh, Paula and, and then uh, Or. Much for those wonderful papers that held together so especially well. Um, I have sort of two questions for um, Karen and Uri together, and then two questions for Tamar, none of which are very well formed. But uh, so starting with Uri and Karen, I'm curious how the methods, the sort of comparing the stories about these women as converters in Islamic sources, especially early ones, the stories about men as converters, sort of what are the main, can we schematize some differences in terms of the way they go about converting, what's unique or different about what the women are doing. So like you expose the fact that they are doing it and what that might say about their power, their agency. But what's distinctive about how these women go about it? That's something I'm curious about. And also, uh, is there, and this is echoing a little bit what Professor Sluhovsky mentioned, a tradition, maybe later in Islam, that women not are more effective maybe as converters, but as converts, whether because they're more emotional or spiritual or because they're more easily swayed or fickle and are these women going to be upheld in subsequent centuries or versions of the same stories as models only for other women or is there something uh, that the wider society can learn in general both men and women from reading about these uh, early female followers of Muhammad and uh, Tamar I was curious about um, 
what you thought more specifically about the way that gender segregation could make for a more effective converting environment. You mentioned that it did, and I imagine that's obviously specifically for potential women converts, but why, and if you could flesh that out a little bit. And also, there's catechizing and then there's baptism. Sort of at what point, so is baptism the conversion? Sort of what's the timeline? At what point does a person decide to convert, agree to convert, considered a convert? Um, and how long is catechism for a child versus a, an adult? It's interesting that these people are given choice, at least officially, but there's a lot of pressure to go in one direction, and I'm just interested in at what point baptism comes into the picture and what difference does it make. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure there is uh, a significant difference. It's not that there aren't women that um, uh, act as converters in, the, in ways of, of being patient, in, in waiting, mainly waiting, but from most of the stories that, I, that I've read depict women as acting in favor of triggering conversion, doing things, talking, moving, bringing her husband back by force almost. Is there more of a focus on family? Yes, that's something that I think is a very apparent throughout conversion stories. This is something that is, is very, it's a very strong theme. More for women? No, no, in general. So I, I haven't, uh, my answer is very limited because all, I haven't surveyed all cases in order to stand here and say, oh, there's a, you know, I've looked at everything and these are the, male topoi and these are the female topoi. But my impression from the, the biographies about men from the time of the prophet, uh, looking at them and thinking about those about women, I think there is a, a difference. Uh, first of all, it's the, I would say that the um, more kind of normal image normal image that emerges from our sources is that conversion is often a male activity. It's the male who is, is in the public domain, he, the woman can remain inside, so the woman can even forget about converting and the man can convert himself. It's important that he converts and uh, the, our sources pay much more attention to men who convert than to women. And that's actually what makes these, so, these stories about women so, so intriguing. And it relates to your second question, but I will, as far as the depictions go, the conversion of men in the time of the prophet are often in the context, context of masculine activities, battle, allegiances, uh, uh, leaders of tribes, leaders of clans and families. Um, and and this shows up time and again in these um, in the so-called uh, Arabian phase of uh, emergent Islam, which is the very early phase. And uh, the women indeed do take part uh, every once in a while in combat activities. But I think the stories here show them operating more within, as Moshe has noted, within the limitations of. Uh, masculine confinements. Okay, so that's one point to make. The second point, um, if I remember correctly your question, uh, it's noteworthy that somewhere around the 9th and 10th century, women disappear from biographic collections. They are suppressed, their presence is suppressed, and they reemerge later in the 12th 13th century and on. This has a lot to do with the emergent Abbasid regime in the second half of the 8th century that was, so the theory goes, was highly influenced by indigenous traditions of patriarchal systems that sought to suppress the presence of the woman into the domicile space. Nonetheless, despite this trend, what does seem to persist in these collections, despite the disappearance of women from other forms of recollection, are those women that converted. And like Moshe noted, very true, 
It's a, there is a, I think there is, there is a reason for that because women are converting to Islam often, in, in many cases separately, separately from their male relatives, whether husbands, fathers, brothers, and so forth. And they and 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 it's in a, it's 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 obviously a male uh, Muslim uh, objective to see these women converting and join the Muslim fold. So over here, we might shut an eye over gender differences. Thank you. Um, so uh, um, thank you for these questions, and I think um, um, uh, they are related in a way. Uh, I mean, what I'm going to say is also related to what you ask them because. Um, let me start by saying that in the Italian peninsula, in the early modern era, as opposed to other parts of southern Europe, uh, um, conversion was not a mass phenomenon. It was, uh, um, and in terms of typology of conversion, it was either individual conversion or one instigated by a member of the family, so what we would call a family conversion. In the vast majority of documented cases that we know of, um, family conversions were instigated by a male member of the family and the women uh, had to, to follow suit, they didn't really. Um, there are very few cases, these are the ones that I was initially interested in when I became interested in nuns who were uh, former Jews, I thought there might be more of those who actually uh, um, initiated their conversion. There are very few cases of, of women and girls who actually were the ones who wanted to convert. Um, and so uh, gender segregation uh, in, in a convent would be helpful, or we know that it was helpful, in cases such as that of the daughter of Italian Medici, who was betrothed to a Jewish youth, and that was the main reason, well, one of the reasons, or according to her father, she did not want to convert because she did not want to break the engagement. And so by putting her in a convent, um, he, her father made sure that she would not have, uh, not, not be able to communicate with um, um, either this person or relatives um, at all. So the, the enclosure of a convent also prevented, in theory, but also to a great degree in practice, um, possible attempts of Jews to try to, to get in touch with these potential converts. Um, it also, um, I mean, life in convents did have many advantages um, for many Christian girls and um, was, I think, also seen as having advantages for some uh, girls who were raised as Jews as well. And uh, we know this because uh, uh, I found one um, um, assertion by a convert who um, actually was compelled to convert after she got married in order to uh, retain custody over her son. But then she says that she's always wanted to become a Christian, and when she was younger and uh, her father wanted to marry her off, she thought to herself, oh, I wish I were a Christian and I could become a nun and not you know, have to be forced to, to, to get married. Um, so I think the, ideal, uh, the idea of um, um, a female community could be appealing and was. Now, of course, they were not sent to just any convent. They were sent to specific convents that were not um, strife freedom, like we know that some early modern convents were, uh, in which there are no cases of, of serious uh, problems, um, and in which, uh, the, I mean, I would think that the uh, kind of female solidarity or companionship that they could find there would be appealing. So that is one reason I think um, this could be appealing. Um, but basically, it also prevented communication with, with the outside uh, uh, world, and um, in terms of how much time they actually spent there. So in general, before the Council of Trent, um, there were 40 days that were required um, um, for preparations to baptism from the moment that one expressed her or his um, willingness to, to be baptized. So they're, uh, in this stage, they're catechumens, and then the moment they're baptized, they become neophytes. Um, and um, after Trent, uh, this Kenneth Stowe would be <laughs> the authority on this, uh, when the issue of um, family members being offered to the church by their relatives, originally just the parents, but later also um, uh, brothers and, and um, fiancés and different kinds of uh, relatives, 
Um, then de depending on the kind of relations and if they're just engaged or they're actually married, that would also have an impact of how long they would be confined. And it's referred to as confined to a place in which they were to be instructed learning the faith, uh, uh, the tenets of the faith before their baptism. But they had theoretically to consent to baptism. The question was uh, just how long they could be in an environment where they would be persuaded to see the light. So I think that answers both your questions. <laughs> Okay, first of all, to the Muslim thing. Um, <laughs> um, given the fact that you both uh, dealt with the same stories and that uh, Karen also presented uh, some of these stories in our academic course, just an informative question are these all the stories that we have, or do we have? more, many more, a few more stories of uh, women as agents of conversion. Are all of them uh, strict to the 7th century? Uh, as you said, we don't have many more before the 12th century. Then, if yes, can we say that uh, stories like these are perhaps typical to an age that uh, religion is not yet consolidated? and that uh, um, hierarchies are not so strong as they are going to be later. And I'm just taking an example from late antiquity and beginning of Christianity when women matrons and they are very, very strong and we have diaconesses and things like that and they, and they can travel all around and, and build, build them monasteries and do whatever they want all over the Roman Empire and then it stops. So this is for you. And for Tami, I, I still um, would like to insist on, on the theological uh, question which you said that we cannot know. Of course, I mean, it is clear that uh, we don't know what uh, persuaded these uh, young uh, Jewish, uh, Jewish girls to, to embrace Christianity. And uh, we know that uh, not, uh, not, not necessarily theology is what converts, and uh, there are other reasons. But still, it will be good to know if women's theology or women's way of persuasion uh, means of persuasion, arguments that they brought was in some way different than those of men. And we don't have necessarily to look in this, I mean, uh, reports that we have, but maybe uh, other, with other um, um, <laughs> narratives of women religiosity in the 15th century or when you work and, and try to think why they were, they were so strong in, in, in this. Okay, as a speaker of the Islamic team, um, um, okay, so first, um, I've gathered somewhere between 40 to 50 stories about women from the time of the Prophet who are acting in various capacities, not necessarily in relations of power but are present in the contents of tensions resulting from uh, joining the Muslim fold. Okay? Um, you note I refrain from the terms converting, I refrain from the term religion, I refrain from the term um, uh, another term. Anyway, uh, so that's... But when I um, went over these stories, I... Uh, broke them down into stories telling about women inspiring others to convert, women who are uh, located in tensions between family and community, women who are 
um, uh, acting as role models, and in various capacities. So there's a lot to be done there, and it's not just you know a, a cherry picking kind of uh, project. Um, it also, Ruth Rodet, who is actually, I think, the pioneer in terms of gathering biographies of, of, uh, of Muslim women, has noted well that Ibn Sides, which is the most comprehensive collection of biographies from the late 8th, early 9th century, out of, uh, I forget the exact number, but uh, thousands of biographies, um, women comprise somewhere between 15 to 20 percent. So, and later on they will count less and less, and they will re-emerge later. Now, whether does that is that telling of a society that is in, actually is in its early stages, therefore uh, gender hierarchies, conventions, what is wrong and what is right, are not formally regulated, uh, you know, regulated in a finalized way. That's a possibility assuming that you're considering these stories to be telling about the events from the time of the prophet. That's a, that's a take. That's a take that you can... I'm not talking about events. About no, you're talking about individuals. Individuals indeed are not events, but they're participating in a broader event that it's called the founding of the Islamic community. <laughs> and, and you can just decide how to treat these stories. If these stories are indeed telling of what's happening in 6.30, let's say, then this could be indeed indicative of a society or a community, religious community or whatever community that is in its formative stage and therefore its uh, members are still not properly regulated. But if you consider these stories as actually things that were considered being worthy to put into writing 150 years later for a different purpose, then you should ask yourself why is it important to present them as such in that period. Those are possibilities. I have no exact answer to that. Thank you a lot. Um, so there were uh, some arguments that were, were directed specifically at potential female um, converts from Judaism. Um, that, and that's not, I mean, I haven't found any in my sources. So let me start with what I find in my sources. In my sources, all the references to nuns as converters refer to their pious example. So it's basically their behavior, just being with the nuns, seeing how they live their lives, and being with women who dedicated themselves to Christ. Um, that would theoretically uh, serve as a proof um, um, on the symbolic level of the uh, veracity of Christianity and, and, and the fact that um, and also, I think um, the symbolic value of, of convents and of um, women who, who became brides of Christ was crucial uh, in this period, especially after Trent. Um, and, um, and that is why after the Council of Trent, um, converts from Judaism are in increasingly encouraged to become nuns, because that would serve symbolically um, as the ultimate proof for the uh, superiority of, of Christianity over Judaism. They do the same thing, they would take Christ as their only uh, uh, spouse. Um, but, um, but we do know, and then this is from just Shia Cohen's work and others have worked on this, that when uh, uh, addressing women, uh, Christian polemicists would uh, point to the fact that um, Jewish women are not circumcised and that therefore suggest, even though Jews of course did not uh, um, adhere to this view, that therefore they are excluded from the covenant. And um, since, um, uh, I know you know that, but I'm just saying it since it's, um, that since um, uh, Christian polemicists equated um, circumcision with uh, with baptism, they would point out that when addressing women or uh, Jewish women, they would say, look here, you know, the Jews don't even treat you as spiritually equal and therefore they don't circumcise you. And circumcision is the sign of the covenant and it leaves an indelible uh, mark like baptism. Um, you know, once you're baptized, you're you know, spiritually equal to all the men who get baptized. So that was one strategy uh, of converting um, female Jews uh, that was specific to, to, to female Jews. 
However, as I said, I have not come across any reference to this um, in the context of, of nuns or nunneries. And I do have to say, and this is very interesting as I was working on this um, um, paper, I thought about it, that we know that, uh, especially from the late 15th century, convent schooling became the um, default option for uh, Christian girls from the artisanal and uh, middling and even impoverished patrician classes in Italy. Um, and, um, and they were, who would be sent, we know that they were sent to convents to be educated for several years until they got married or became nuns. And Sharon Strokia uh, has written about it, um, but we don't know what they were taught. So there, there are no um, school or textbooks or school instructions specifically for these boarding schools. We know that they existed, we know that they were very popular. So this, of course, changes with later uh, in the 16th century with the uh, foundation of specifically teaching orders. Um, but they are not, um, but I, I don't know about teaching orders specifically involved with conversion. So, I mean, my, my, the convents that I'm interested in, the ones who took on potential converts from Judaism would be the same converts that took on um, convents that took on borders, just young girls who were either orphaned or their fathers couldn't take care of them, or orphaned from their mother, and were sent to a convent to be educated, and we don't know exactly what they learned, but we just know that they theoretically were supposed to come out more pious, and the example, the devout lives of the nuns was supposed to play a major role. So. Okay, this is mostly for tomorrow, although I would be interested in the perspectives of um, Team Islam as well. And that is um, about the question of social class and to what extent it is a factor in women as agents of conversion. In Counter-Reformation Italy, we know that the social class of nuns matters tremendously for their continued power, both within the convent and in their ongoing links to their families. So how does that play a role in the nuns who become agents of conversion and the convents that particularly play a role as hosting Jewish girls? And likewise, to what extent is the idea of social mobility an issue in the conversion of Jewish nuns. I mean, obviously, they're getting a better husband than any that anyone had imagined. But equally, um, is there a notion that they might be moving up or down socially by spending time in the conference? So we'll ask together. So take me the team yeah. versus team. Yeah. So a question for Team Islam. Um, you, oh, you spoke a little bit about the, the problem, the question of the sources, in terms of the time gap, but mostly in terms of the authenticity, the veracity of the sources, whether they're actually to be, uh, uh, are, are credible. And my question is uh, the problem of um, the, the ramifications of the time gap in terms of the cultural differences. The earliest of the biographers, they've been cited, the uh, early 9th century, right, is, um, is working in uh, an urban, um, uh, setting is a, is, a, is a learned intellectual whose life doesn't resemble in any way the life of the people he's, he, he's, he's writing about, nor is the life of the people he, for who will be uh, uh, reading it. It's completely uh, reconstructed, or there's a, a, a projection of a, a kind of reality that they're hoping to reconstruct. That must have some kind of implication over how the re recorded or at least how they how they read it. So read this. Right. Thank you, Teacher. I started. Okay. So uh, thank you, Emily. These are uh, two um, um, important questions. Um, first of all, and I mentioned earlier that uh, most cases of individuals who instigate either their own conversion or those of their families are men, 
the women that we do know of who initiate their conversion in the vast majority of cases in Italy do so because they wish to marry a Christian. So it's uh, or to improve their marital prospects, uh, as we know from the article of Boxel and others that you know. Uh, but uh, um, and and not to become nuns. They are, um, as I said, after Trent, often encouraged to become nuns, uh, encouraged to become nuns by their fathers, especially fathers who convert uh, primarily for economic reasons and want to save on the diaries. And then uh, I found a letter in the um, Vatican Library from uh, a neophyte who says, I have six uh, Nobel uh, daughters, and uh, one of them agrees to uh, become a nun. So can I get help with getting at least the, it was very low dowry, I don't remember how much, but at least for her, you know, we'll get read of this one. But um, so definitely, it was not a way of social mobility, it was a way for, and, and it's amazing to see, I mean, it was amazing for me, how quickly Jewish fathers, once they convert, uh, um, capitalize on the new option that they have to actually save on the dowries very quickly. But it also, I think, goes to show, since we assume that they do not really, when they convert, become completely new persons, we may assume that they had a pretty positive uh, notion of convents uh, before their conversion. And I think that's something uh, very interesting. I think that Jews actually regarded convents in general as uh, uh, places that would be safe for their daughters. And then as soon as they have the legal opportunity to send their girls there, um, it's a good. Um, so these are uh, the cases that I found. In most of the cases, and I do have a database of nuns, uh, in, of nuns in Italy who were baptized Jews from the 15th to the 18th century, um, most of them became nuns and became choir, choir nuns and not servant nuns. So they became um, nuns, uh, um, the high status nuns who would uh, be uh, liable, would be able to be promoted uh, within the convent chapter and did not perform the manual labors um, that the convent did in the convents. Um, so in this respect, it really was a way of social mobility, although, as I said, most of them did not choose this vocation. It was chosen for them by their fathers. I did find one case in uh, Foligno in which, uh, from the late 15th century, in which a Jew ran away from home, became a nun, and ended up serving as a prioress. Um, so she really did, was a social thing. But, but in this case, I think we may assume that there really was a genuine conversion there, or spiritually and religiously motivated conversion um, there. Um, the convents uh, that they were sent to, so as I said, um, after 1543, um, things change, um, and especially after Trent, they change. In Rome, there is a convent that is established specifically for nuns who were uh, baptized Jews, and they're encouraged to enter it, and not other convents. Um, but in other cities, they, there are specific convents, usually Dominicans, that are um, kind of specialized in um, accepting um, nuns of Jewish origins. Um, and these are often upper-class um, convents, um, but sometimes also, I did find some Clarissan convents that were no, not as upper class. So it's hard um, to say. Um, what else was I going to add about this? I think the major factor here is that it was a way um, in family conversions of, of saving on the dowry, and which is why we also find cases of, after the father's conversion, two or three girls being sent to the convent together if they could, which would uh, was an imitation of the Christian way of dealing with similar economic problems in this period. I'll say a few words about social um, uh, class. I think that the very fact that these women were included in these biographical dictionaries is an indication of their social and religious status because the fact they were included allows them to, to give information about the prophet and hence their source of knowledge and they are respected and honored for that. Also some of these women will be later met as mothers or um, relatives of important figures. So we 
they are there because they will become later on important. Okay, you have only two minutes before your lunch break, so I'm going to be very, very concise. Um, a, I, you are hitting a very uh, important point, and uh, I believe these stories are meant for an urban audience of a particular social rank, particular literate social rank, but also exposed to literary materials, not necessarily literate. And recent studies such as Conrad Hischler's, Jonathan Berkey's, and Samir Ali's all speak of the public spaces in which uh, stories of this type were orated or delivered to public audiences that included women, by the way. Um, as for the different contexts of life, those of the Arabian Peninsula and those of urban spaces, say in Iraq, at Ibn Sides, for instance, you may ask the same question about people who are reading the Agadah of Pesach in the 21st century, about rabbinic sages gathering in Palestine in the second century. Um, it's a totally different social reality. Nonetheless, the story about these people, and we can go to get many other examples, still play some kind of role in the lives of generations that exist some 2,000 years later. Thank you. Uh, we don't have time for more questions, so sorry. And you have a uh, uh, lunch, no? Yes. Yeah.